All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to our study of、uh, a work by Johann Gerhard,、um, a meditation of his called "The Desire for Eternal Life." Were there some handouts that went around this morning? Did everybody get a handout? If you didn't, are there any extras around? There are no extras. All right, listen very carefully. If you didn't get one, and we'll do the best we can, we'll try to have some more for you next week. It comes out of this this text, which may look a little different because this text is always going in and out of print.、Um, but this is Sacred Meditations by Johann Gerhard, and of course, he is known as maybe the third of the most influential Lutheran reformers. You have Martin Luther, Martin Chemnitz, Johann Gerhard. So. Without further ado, we're going to jump right back into this text in order to give us a little context. Of course,、um, I'll review where we have been. I always like to begin my classes with an invocation of prayer, so let's let's do that, and then we'll jump right in. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Okay, so our lives are hidden with Christ. And our eyes should be set on those things that are above, and not below. And the scriptures are filled with references to the inheritance that we are receiving with Christ and in Christ. What precisely is that inheritance? Of of what does it consist? What is coming our way? Those things to which we look forward. And that's really what this is a meditation on. Gerhard, as we saw last week, one of the first things he does is compares this life in its finitude with that life which is to come in its infinitude. So the very first thing he does is shrinks down this life, which is so profoundly helpful for us because it shrinks down both the woes and the joys. It shrinks down the woes because no matter what it is that we are going through, it is. Temporary, it is temporal in the literal sense. It is a passing, or even Paul is so bold to say, a momentary affliction. I think that carries extra weight when you refer to Saint Paul, who spends many years of his life imprisoned, is beaten within an inch of his life many, many times, hardly is living his quote-unquote best life now. As a saint and apostle of God, and yet he refers to all of these things as momentary, light, light and momentary afflictions that do not compare to the insurmountable weight of glory that is to come. And indeed, that these afflictions are earning for us. So there's a direct connection. Between the afflictions we're enduring and that glory which is to come. Okay, well, what is that glory? And this is where Gerhard's so wonderful because he fleshes it out for us, really in some in some normal ways, but also in some remarkable and inspirational ways. So, just on the、uh, the front page of your handout, if you recall, we'll just kind of speed through. He says, if if you are desirous of beauty. Then remember that the righteous shall shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. In other words, that longing for beauty we have in this life is fulfilled to the utmost in what we receive in that life which is to come. Okay, what about activity and strength? That desire to be strong in our bodies, to be productive and active, does that go away? Do we, do we,、uh, upon dying, do we Im- immediately just become little choir people with our hands eternally pressed like this, who who do nothing but sit in eternal church service, floating around on white clouds? No, no. There is a 
a vim and a vigor and a vitality that God gives to us. Now, of course, he gives that to us in spades in life. You look down at your grandkids or your kids, they have the energy of a puppy dog. You say, if only I had just a little bit of that. Uh, but that vitality, that activity and strength will return to us in heaven. Of course, the joy and the blessedness of heaven is you'll have the maturity to know what to do with it. <laughs> when you're a little kid, you have the energy and not the maturity to know what to do with it. When you're an older person, you know what to do with it, but you don't have it. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is... In many respects, the, the background of this whole meditation of Gerhard, I don't know, I don't have any reason to believe that he's, he's conscious of this, but it's Ecclesiastes. And it's this sort of fact that life doesn't line up the way it should line up. And those joys that we see in this life are always elusive. They're always there, but not quite reachable, reachable, but not quite fulfilling. There's always something more for which we're longing. We can grasp hold of that. We stand in good company with Gerhard, with Pascal. We can stand in, in, in a good company and assert that these desires within us are implanted by God himself such that we can realize that this life is not our home, this life is not our fulfillment. But all of these desires will be fulfilled in that life which is to come. And of course, chiefly, in the beatific vision, in the sight of God, in the knowledge of God, in the unmitigated experience of God. So we'll see that emerge, of course, as a theme in this writing too. What else besides beauty, activity, and strength? Well, also healthful life. Healthful life. You kind of miss it, don't you? You start hitting your 30s and you start to see that healthful life go away. Instead of the doctor saying, ah, everything's great, you're the epitome of health. It's like, well, there's a couple things you can work on. Well, what becomes a couple things in your 30s? What's that like in your 40s? There's half a dozen things you could work on. <laughs> Pretty soon there's no good report at all, is there? It's like, here's where we're at, here's where I need you to be. <laughs> yeah, so this, this long and healthful life, again, this, just this, this overwhelming continuous health is to be received by us in that life which is to come. And so we can look forward to that. We can look forward to an end of doctor's appointments, an end of worrying. You know, the longer you spend on this earth, the more time you spend just trying to keep yourself here, right? <laughs> got to research all the vitamins, got to buy all the vitamins, got to take all the vitamins. What are you doing this week? I don't know, scheduling appointments with specialists. That's about it. Yeah. So we start spending all our time trying to get more time. <laughs> oh my, yeah, yeah. But, but we want to live forever. Are you sure about that? How about if we live forever in an entirely different place, an entirely different way, one in which we have healthful life as a free gift of God to us? All right, and then we kind of, we kind of leap ahead just a little bit here. The next one he says is um, longing for full satisfaction. It's kind of a nice allusion to the climax of this text and the climax of our meditation. And that is that full satisfaction comes only in God. Comes only in God. This life is a master class in teaching us that this life and the things of this life don't satisfy us. We know it immediately by lack. And when we say it should be this way and it's not this way and that upsets me. But we also know it by blessing. Here it is, here's the blessing, but I'm not ultimately fulfilled. Here it is, here's the blessing, but it passes, right? So this life is a masterclass through both joy and sorrow in leading us to the recollection, as Augustine profoundly says, that our souls are restless until they find their rest in thee. Man was not strictly speaking made to be fulfilled by woman, nor was woman, strictly speaking, made to be fulfilled by man. Nor were we, as the peak and epitome of God's creation, meant to be fulfilled by creation. Our souls are designed to be satisfied in God and God alone. In fact, the rest only finds its proper ordering and its proper joy, its relative joy, 
once we are rightly related to God, to see him as he is, to know him as he is. That beatific vision, to see him as he is and know him as he is, is really the linchpin of the scriptures, linchpin of Christian theology in terms of the essence of what eternal life is, the essence of what heaven and the new heavens and the new earth are, the essence of what all joy is. And so all of these other things redound, these relative joys redound, flow from and, uh, and, and resound back to um, God in, in prayer, praise, and thanksgiving. But there's this whole economy of joys and blessings, and at the very center, as, as Alpha and Omega, as source and ending, is this beatific vision of God. So satisfaction, and then, and then we start going off in a little more detail. What about music? What about music? How are we going to get a pipe organ up there into the heavenly sphere? No, there's all kinds of music, all kinds of instruments, all kinds of diversity. And there won't really be this distinction that we kind of talk about where we talk about Christian or secular. It will all be to the praise and glory of God. It might not sound anything like typical earthly church music, but it will nonetheless be all to the praise and glory of God. So if you love music, don't think that you're, you know, oh gosh, I've got to get that concert in before I die. I don't, I, you know, nobody can guarantee me if the music's going to be any good in heaven. Ha! Yeah, if you look at Revelation, heaven is filled with music, continual music. Even when you're doing something else, there's still the ongoing liturgy of heaven, angels, archangels, all the company of heaven, the most odd and weird and unique creatures, these angels. They're not the little Christmas angels we've been led. You know, I think that that's what Satan is trying to do. He's trying to make the afterlife look and seem profoundly boring. Like you'd never want to go there anyway. And the Bible, the Bible, basically every page that even references heaven or references angels is filled with all kinds of intrigue and wonder beyond our imagination. You've got these, these beings that we can hardly even comprehend. The prophets can hardly even pen intelligibly what they look like, what they are. These are the beings that are continually and perpetually singing God's glory in the heavens. So to say the least, music will be there. Music, the likes of which we've never even heard, nor can even comprehend the wonder thereof. So we look forward, we look forward to that. And then, of course, pure and holy pleasures. I love this, because it's kind of a false Christian asceticism that says pleasure is bad. Didn't God make pleasure? Yeah. So as long as it's pure and holy, then we'll have pleasures. And again, Think, think of, you know, the, the great problem with the pleasures of this life is, is no sooner than you, you've enjoyed it, whatever it is, okay, no sooner than you've enjoyed it, it's like I've got to be careful to keep that in moderation. You know, think of the, think of like the, the decadent chocolate that you, you taste it and you enjoy it and immediately it's like, oh, that tastes too good to be good for me. <laughs> I've got to be careful. Just one. Okay, just two, you know, and so forth. But there's always this sense of like, enjoy, but enjoy cautiously. How freeing it will be to have nothing but pure and holy pleasures set before us. You either can't overindulge or you won't want to overindulge. However it works itself out, it doesn't materially matter because we will we will no longer have that tenuous, thoughtful, self-critical relationship with pleasure. We want good, but not too much good to where it becomes addictive. We don't have to wrestle with any of that. It's just full and free. So I love this. Pleasure. Pleasure is coming. And then, of course, wisdom. Continued growth in wisdom. And I, I waxed on that a little bit. Um, last week, where it's not just like, okay, well, open your Bible. I mean, it's like, yeah, open your Bible with the Lord himself teaching you what these words are, what these mysteries mean, how things wrap together in ways you didn't even understand. But then not just your Bible. The whole of creation, all the things that we've studied in our various careers, vocations, hobbies, etc. It's like, why would we think those things would go away? They won't go away. They'll be more fully understood. Nature itself will be expounded by our Lord, no different than Scripture. Scripture is the 
specific revelation of God. Nature's the general revelation of God. To study nature is to study God. And because you're studying the artwork and thereby you're studying the artist who made it. And you're going to find all kinds of mystery and majesty that God has written into creation. Already we see it just in its profundity in terms of its size. Or you can go from size and think of the billions upon billions of galaxies that each hold billions upon billions of stars. Or you can go all the way down to the cell and just keep going smaller and smaller and smaller all the way down. The majesty of God in creation. How thing, why things are the way they are. How they relate. What God's intentions were. What things they teach. All of this, or much of this at least, has been lost to us. And so the new heavens and the new earth will be a master class in gaining wisdom. What else? Friendship. Friendship, he mentions. And I think this goes along with it to some degree. Christian fellowship and concord. How we long to be united as a, as a church, as a people of God and a people of Christ here in this life that will finally and fully be experienced. What God has already given us will finally and fully be experienced in the new heavens and the new earth, along with friendship. Along with friendship. You know, we look at, we look at um, David and Jonathan in the, in the Old Testament. They stand out for this unique friendship. It's a foretaste of that heavenly friendship which, which is to come. And many of us have, have dear friends, dear friends we've stayed in touch with, but then other friends we haven't. And then, of course, in, today, in today's, you know, where you're traveling, you're moving all the time, other people are moving, friends get lost and we can find ourselves in a rather isolated place. Saying, I don't, I don't have a friend. I don't have someone to whom I could bear my soul. Or maybe even worse experience. I did have someone to whom I could bear my soul. I bared it and was betrayed. Was betrayed. A friendship in this world is a challenging and unfulfilled thing, but we glimpse it. We know we want it. We all desire it. We glimpse it, we taste it, but we don't yet have it. Gerhard here points to the fact that God made friendship and friendship will be had in that life which is to come. Not only friendship, but then of course Christian fellowship and concord. How unpleasant it is to meet a fellow Christian and immediately engage in some theological issue or discrepancy. How good and how pleasant it will be to simply join together and be edified by whatever comes out of whoever's mouth. Be lovely, just wonderful. Christian fellowship. And then these next two, controversial, but I think wonderful. If power, there will be power there, the power of God. Right? So we think of power, especially as Christians, as something to be suspicious of, true enough. And yet we realize that when all power is with God and all and power has, has pushed out of the cosmos all evil, then power itself becomes good. It becomes that, that which energizes all good things. And the distribution of that power simply becomes the distribution of the power to bless. So power's there as well as honor and riches. What a lovely thing that Revelation tells us the streets of the heavenly Jerusalem are paved with gold. The most priceless thing on earth is what you walk on up there. That's a beautiful thought and meditation. But then also the places of such profound beauty that the most beautiful things we can conceive of here on earth are the lowest things there. So the, the beauty the honor, the riches, the extravagance of the new Jerusalem and the new world, the new creation, are such that everything in this life pales in comparison to it. We'll finally have good architecture again. Now there's make America great again, make journalism great again. All of this is exactly right. Um, make architecture great again. We probably don't, you don't, if you've traveled to, Ger, uh, to Germany, I'm a little biased there, Europe, <laughs> Europe, you'll find beautiful architecture, you'll find buildings meant to last, you'll find bu buildings that speak something, that inspire something, that lift up humanity to the heavens, that, that um, you know, reflect a kind, of, a kind of profundity to our lives. 
do you find that here in America? Not really. Not really. You find kind of a drab, bland, utilitarian, let's, uh, let's make architecture great again. And so in heaven, of course, it will be honor and riches, power, all of it redeemed and set in its proper order. And then, of course, last but not least, in fact, in many ways, the linchpin to it all, true security, true security and to be comforted. Because if it, if it can all be taken away, then it all becomes, I mean, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? That any credit can be, that can be lost is a, is a mental liability. Anything that you hold dear, and insofar as you hold dear, it's that equal weight of liability. You know, it's that, it's that line from uh, A Mighty Fortress. Goods, honor, child, and spouse. And whatever you, whatever you cling to, whatever you value, whatever you can't lose, while it's a, while it's a priceless blessing to you, the price is precisely that you're afraid of losing it. And that losing it is that equivalent cost. This is where, this is where, you know, Hinduism, to some extent Taoism, is really this idea of, oh yeah, Buddhism has its tangents in this, of course. Maybe Buddhism is even a better example. Yeah, now that I think of it, I think it is. But you've got this, you've got this idea of, of non-desiring. Because desire, if fulfilled, equals pain when leveraged against you or taken away. And so like the, so like the profoundest way you can be is to be non-desirous. Non, no blessings, no sufferings. That's really the principle, right? If you don't love anything, nothing can be taken from you. <laughs> Oh, what a wretched way to be. What a wretched way to be. We don't want any lows, so we'll take away the highs, and then there won't be any lows. Oh, terrible. So, so we feel that, it, we feel that acutely in this fallen world that to love is, if not to suffer, to open oneself up to suffering. It's precisely what love is. Here's where you can see that love isn't any of these false religions, but love is God, and God is love, and the love of God in Christ Jesus is God's love or God as love expressed so that when Christ is on the cross, dying for the sins of the world, dying in faithfulness and love to God, dying in faithfulness and love to the, to the human race, that's the epitome of what love is in a fallen world. Love is suffering. Love is laying down one's life for the good of his friends. So to love is to invite suffering just is. But how blessed it will be in a non-fallen world where that's no longer what love means. And the simultaneous call to love and call to the cross are not one and the same. Precisely because the love embodied in the cross has set us free from this painful reality. No longer to, to love is to, is to be vulnerable, to love is to suffer that will be put away so that we will have perfect security. So that whether it's love or whether it's anything we put our mind to or our hand to, it will not perish. It will truly be secure. And in this we will be comforted. There won't be thief to steal. There won't be moth to devour or rust to destroy. There, What is will always be. You'll read a book and five years later you'll remember it. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? You'll read a scripture and it'll be there. Ah, can't wait. Can't wait. Okay, all of this drives to the thesis, the very bottom of page 268 in your handout. Three lines up from the bottom. Whatever the elect can possibly long for. That's That right there is a beautiful statement. Not whatever the human being, because then we have this problem of what about the fallen human desires. Whatever the elect, whatever the saint of God, whatever the baptized child of the heavenly father can possibly long for, there they shall find to their infinite satisfaction. 
For then they shall see him face to face. Here's the linchpin from 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. For then shall they see him face to face, who is all and in all. The blessings thou shalt there enjoy shall be immeasurable, without number, and inconceivably precious. He is the beginning and the ending of all these blessings, to see our Lord face to face. Okay, so all the pious longing, all the godly desire, is fulfilled. That's what we're looking forward to. That, in short, is what is the inheritance in the saints. That is, in short, why Christ goes to the cross in the fullness of joy. It's why his message of proclaiming the gospel is always permeated with joy. It's why the church, even in the midst of suffering, has a joy that is deeper than that suffering. It's why even we as Christians, when we weep at the trials and afflictions of this life, that inner joy that Christ gives cannot be taken away. It is unaffected. Because we know who our Lord is. We know what he's done for us. We know that Christ has died to take away our sins. But it's not as if the gospel simply stops there. That's the foundation of the gospel. The foundation of the good news upon which the inheritance of the saints is built. The fullness of the revelation thereof being to see God face to face. To know him even as we are known. All right, let's pause there. See if you have any... uh, Any thoughts before we kind of launch into um, a connected meditation, obviously, but I think we do somewhat shift gears here. Any, uh, Any thoughts or reflections? I see a hand up here about halfway. I was thinking when you were um, speaking about how the things that are valued highly here are are lower in heaven or will be. And it made me think of self because all of this is on earth. The self is so important. What we think or believe is right or what we feel about this or that, what what makes us angry or happy or sad. It's Mm. usually about us when it comes Mm. down to it because we're sinful. And it'll be so nice when you were talking about showing the joy and love and made me think of David jumping around naked too or whatever (laughs) he was in. because He was so overjoyed that you don't, you're just joyful in the Lord. Right. And to put self away. It's a great (laughs) point. In fact, you're you're just a little bit ahead of the text because that's kind of, that's kind of where we're going next is one of the, one of the most from our vantage point, again, because we're so egotistic, just by nature, by fallen nature, one of the greatest joys about heaven is that we are no longer going to be ourselves. Hey, we're going to have a we're going to have a, a continuity of experience, so that I'm not going to be like, oh, now I'm in heaven. My name's Ted. No, <laughs> I'm I'm still Jeremy. I'm still the one whom God baptized. I'm still me. But here's the thing, I'm me in such a profoundly different way. I'm me as God wanted me to be. I'm me free from the incurvatus in say, the self curved in upon itself, the egotistic I. I'm free from all of that. And so one of the, one of the deepest delights of, of heaven, even just passing through death itself, will be to suddenly be you as God made you to be. You as God intended you to be. That's, and then, and then from there, like, okay, so, so that's your new receptor, if you will. Now you're going to experience all these joys and light and delights purely and truly selflessly. Selflessly. Yeah, it's a wonderful reflection. Thank you for bringing that up. And, and of course, Gerhard's going to touch on that. Please, sir. Yeah. Um, what, what are we specifically talking about in the sense that are, is this at the new heavens and the new earth after the resurrection? Or would we experience some of this at our death uh, when we're not at the new heavens and the new earth yet? Uh, could you just talk about that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I think this would be Gerhard's answer. Let's not get specific. <laughs> I think that would truthfully be his answer, because what you're going to see as we go on is like, well, which is he talking about, heaven or the new heavens and the new earth, um, before the resurrection or after the resurrection? Um, and sometimes it's hard to tell, and, and sometimes I think that that might be a little beside the point. So um, I, the, the easy Gerhard answer is just yes, yes. Um, 
But in, but in truth, Bob, of course you bring up a good point, and a point that I frequently talk about. Dying and going to heaven is indeed going to paradise, as the scriptures say, as Jesus himself says. It is indeed to die and be with the Lord. What could be better than that? So heaven is heaven, and I'm not taking anything away from heaven. It is paradise, it is heaven, it is with the Lord. And yet there's a sense in which even the heavens themselves need to be remade. Thus a new heavens and a new earth. There was, of course, sin in heaven. When Satan and all his angels were up there accusing the brethren day and night, Revelation 12, there was indeed war in heaven. Of what that consists, we're not exactly sure. We don't exactly know, but the heavenly version of war and violence took place. The heavens need to be remade. There's even some hints and allusions that heaven is a place not where there are no tears, but where tears are wiped away. Not where there is no need for healing, but where healing takes place. Right? So I encourage a little bit more of a three-dimensional view of what it is to get into heaven and what it is to be in heaven. And I think that that's very helpful because so much of the Bible is, and the great crescendo of this creation and God's work is not that we die and go to heaven. It's that day when the Lord Jesus returns, we are all raised in our bodies and all things are fully and finally made new. The new heavens and the new earth are given over. And again, we in our bodies, that means we are fully human as God intended us to be. It's the fullness thereof receiving the fullness of the new heavens and the new earth. So, yeah, and, and so maybe, Bob, in, in my own mind as I read this, I sort of have that in mind um, more than anything else. But I'm not sure that Gerhard would necessarily agree. I just know that in the new heavens and the new earth, raised in our bodies, made new, with sin put away forever, with full oneness between God and man, um, creator and creature, and that communion we share with him, um, all of these things will be fulfilled at that point, if not earlier. Now, so hopefully that's a fair answer. Okay, any other, uh, any other thoughts, questions, comments? All right, let's go a little further then. Three lines down from the top of page 269. There we shall rejoice in eternal health of body, the greatest purity of soul. So you can see here like the dichotomy of body and soul, both healed. The body with health, the soul with purity. And that, I mean, what that really means is like, you don't have to second guess your thoughts anymore. There is no such thing as temptation anymore. It's all completely pure. Whatever is there in your mind, whatever thoughts are there, whatever looks interesting or intriguing or desirous, it's all pure. That is the blessed freedom of the saints in its fullness. Okay, not just health of the body, greatest purity of the soul, but Gerhard continues, the riches of divine glory and pleasure. And again, there's a subtle hint here, it's a little more explicit elsewhere, where the very idea of what we find pleasurable will go through profound change. You know, right, right now, what do I find pleasurable? A moment by myself to do something on this thing. Is that going to be the pleasure I have in heaven? No. No. The pleasures in heaven are going to be vastly different. Our souls are going to be vastly different. Our entire perception and mindset, vastly different. So the riches of divine glory and pleasure, he continues, the perpetual companionship of the angels. This is so overlooked. Not only the saints in all their glory and diversity, but the angels in all their glory and diversity. I think this is an absolutely fair statement and a very helpful way to think. Um, when you look at scripture and the diversity of the angels, it's, it, they're almost unspeakably diverse. Uh, one of the worst tricks Satan did to us was, was teach us that angels are all chubby little babies blowing trumpets or, or long-haired pacifists with white wings. Uh, yeah, no, no. Uh, angels defy your imagination. If there's one universal about angels biblically, it's that whenever you come into the presence of one in your mortal sinful state, you immediately fall on your face or show great terror because the angel's first thing that he always says is, if you're not. 
<laughs> okay, but there's such a profound diversity. I think it's Aquinas who argues this way, and I think he's I think he's absolutely right. He says he says look at the diversity of terrestrial, visible, material life. From the elephant to the platypus to the insect to the thing you can only see under a microscope. That's a reflection of who God is. Now, insofar as earth is both lower and more finite than heaven, what do you think the angels are and are like? So Aquinas posits such a diversity of angels. He even, I think it might be a bit hyperbolic, but he even says every single angel is its own species. There's such a unique and profound diversity among them. Um, and how it is that we'll interpret them through our senses. It's just limitless. It's limitless to think of. And so joyful. I mean, could there be, could there be angels that effectively have, have what we would perceive of as, as lower intelligence than us? And yet extreme power and ability? It sure seems that way from some of the scriptures. Would some of the angels have such profundity of experience and perception? They might sense things that we can't sense. You know, our five senses, maybe they've got six, seven, eight. <laughs> our, our, uh, our kind of three-dimensional existence, maybe they've got a fourth or a fifth. <laughs> I mean, it's limitless. It's limitless. As Vicar was reflecting with me after last class, it's like, and what's to say that our own range of colors don't change? Our own range of... Uh, Hear what we can hear uh, doesn't change, and so on and so forth. And then, and then all of this perceiving these wonderful and glorious creatures, the companionship of the angels, all of them holy, all of them on the side of the Lord, all of them exactly as the Lord made them to be. And now we as saints joining with them, redeemed by Christ, glorified by Christ, you know, not a, we, don't, we aren't second class citizens. There's no angel that could say, yeah, but you're uh, one of those fallen folks, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah, to say that is actually to blaspheme against Christ, who came and took our sins and bore them as his own. Like, if there's any shame that would, that would be ours, Christ has taken it all upon himself. And so no angel's ever going to point down and say, yeah, but you did that, or you did this, or you're second hand, or the only reason you're in here is because Jesus. That would be to insult Jesus. For a holy angel to look at us, they see us as cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. They don't see any sins. They see light. They see the blood of their creator. They rejoice with us. They uphold and uh, they uphold us and lift us up. So the companionship to the angels and the saints. And there all the eccentricities of the saints won't strike us as odd or weird or off-putting, but as completely enjoyable. The diversity of God in his, in his creation and his wisdom that's so contrary to our own. He continues, whilst our bodies shall shine in the splendor of the glory of God. Um, he's actually tapping in, okay, well, what he says is true anyway. I mean, so in heaven, in all likelihood, you know, you're clothed with the robe of Christ, fair enough. Um, but in a sense, too, you return to that Edenic nakedness. Remember how Adam and Eve were naked, but they didn't know it? And then they ate, and then they realized they were naked? There's a sense in which we return to that Edenic nakedness. The church fathers viewed that Edenic nakedness and the change as not strictly a perceptual one, where they were naked but didn't perceive it, and then they ate the fruit and then perceived. That's actually kind of like problematic the more you think of it, um, that sort of view. Anyway, like, like, oh, I don't perceive that I'm naked, and then you eat the fruit, and you're like, what is that? You know, that doesn't make any sense. But what the church fathers saw is that, is that the human body was clothed with glory, with light. And it, in its nakedness, radiated a light and a glory that kept everything decent, even without clothing. And precisely what was lost in the eating of the fruit was that glory and light so that they could finally see as they were. They could see and perceive their nakedness. Okay, so this is a beautiful kind of tip of the hat to that to that theology, um, where here our bodies shall once again shine in the splendor of the glory of God. And that, uh, you know, that's such a beautiful thing too, because it means, it means 
you know, there's a weird thing that happens in that we see our own bodies, we immediately experience nakedness or shame. Well, at least at a certain point we do. I don't know exactly when that happens. My kids sure don't. <laughs> Little kids don't care. Um, but, but at a certain point you start to care. And then, and then you, um, and then you have this experience of like, of like kind of shame and secrecy and hiding and not fit for. And there's this whole nexus of things. All of that's taken away. I just am who I am. I'm as God made me. And that's right. There's no judgment. There's no comparison. There's no shame. There's no fear. There's no self consternation. Um, it's just simply free and free in a way that is pure and holy, our bodies shining in the splendor of the glory of God. And again, this comes right from Jesus' lips, too, that we shine in the kingdom of his Father. So I know that, like, it's like, well, that, that's just poetic. Uh, probably not. Probably not. Probably we will literally see each other as shining, as radiating with the glory of God. Yes, sir. Oh, one second. We, uh, we got to do the long microphone walk up here. Eventually we're going to get, um, these microphones in the ceiling so that you can just talk and they'll pick you up. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I'd have to look at the, the context of, of this in Matthew, but do you suppose there's more than one dimension in which we will shine? Like we will shine by virtue of our intellect and our, I mean, like all of these things will, I mean, we're talking physically here. No doubt that's in view, but mm -hmm. What, what, what do you think the other ways that will shine? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you want to take it into the sort of the metaphorical shining, but just our keen intellect, incapability of making error, you know, that kind of thing, incapability of misperceiving, misunderstanding, right? All of that's there. We don't gain infinite wisdom. We don't become um, omniscient because um, to become omniscient is to become God. We don't become, um, we don't, we don't, we're not outside of time. To be outside of time is to be God. To be outside of time is also to know everything. I mean, these things all, these things all collapse in a kind of singularity. So what we, we won't know everything. In fact, we'll each know different amounts of things, but what we do know will be perfect. And that perception will continue to, that perception, that knowledge, as far as best as we can tell, will continue to increase and grow throughout time. Okay. So yeah, yeah, obviously, I mean, the whole of the human being, though. However you want to slice and dice it. Intellect, will, emotions, all of that redeemed. Memory, redeemed. All of it. Yeah, shining, no doubt. All right, Gerhard continues. Oh, how the redeemed shall rejoice in the delights of their heavenly home, in the blessed society of that celestial kingdom. Ha! He hints at a couple of things. I won't, I won't go into detail here, but, but think of how sick our societies are. It'll be a perfect society and culture. So the, the sum will be greater than the parts. And there will be this, this society and this culture of heaven um, that is just unimaginable because it's good and pure all the way through. Delighting in our heavenly home, blessed society of that celestial kingdom, in the glorification of their bodies. Oh, how they shall exult as they think of the world that for their love of Christ they despised. Insofar as we despise this life and this world and aren't intoxicated with its good things, and taken away from our Lord, taken away from the Creator by the creation itself, insofar as we reject that and reject the creation in favor of the Creator and despise the lesser things for the greater, in that day we rejoice. That's Gerhard's reflection here. We rejoice that for the love of Christ we despise this world. And likewise, rejoicing of the awful torments of hell that we have escaped. Yeah, because whereas, whereas hell seems sort of fictitious to us in these latter days where our souls are so disturbed and, and twisted by the times, where, whereas hell seems hard to believe, it will be very easy to believe in hell. It will be, in fact, we won't have to believe. We'll know it just as easily as we know that there's a heaven, and we will be glad to be free of it forever. 
And that's a way and sense in which these present sufferings will also shrink and diminish because it's like, okay, there wasn't strictly speaking a cost, but there, because Christ paid it all, but there was this, these things we had to endure. Was that endurance worth it? Absolutely. And the satisfaction of knowing that comes in its fullness. Gerhard continues, the most insignificant crown of eternal life shall be far preferable to a thousand worlds because that is infinite whilst these are but finite. Beautiful statement. Remember how Satan tempted Jesus? Look at all the kingdoms of the earth. All these will be yours if you'll just bow down and worship me. What are those kingdoms? Dust. Nothing. Changing, perishable, finite, gone. While what we receive in faithfulness to God is eternal and forever. He continues, Nor need we fear that different degrees of glory in heaven will ever occasion envy in the hearts of the redeemed. For unity of love will reign in all. Right, so the scriptures hold out promise of reward and of differing degrees of glory. Indeed, even in this life, we already experience that. We already experience people who have been rewarded by God. We experience people whose their reward by God has been deferred to the next life. We experience people who are blessed in one way that we're not blessed. And I really here I'm talking about our fellow Christians, of course. That's what I mean. Um, we see one Christian who's blessed with intellect, another who's blessed with charity, uh, one who's blessed with... Uh, the ability to preach, the other who is blessed with the ability to show mercy. We've got all kinds of a diversity of gifts already. That diversity carries on organically into heaven so that there are, in fact, different degrees of glory. It's kind of like, to me, it always, it always conjures up the image of the garden in a kind of metaphorical way, where in the garden there are trees and there are flowers and there are little pla- they're all glorious, they're all wonderful, they all have their own unique beauty, and there is no ego, so it's all to the praise and glory of God. So we can, we can look forward um, to being egoless, such that we enjoy those of differing and, and greater degrees of glory. And of course, how surprising and shocking all of this will be in the most delightful way, because who would have thought that widow dropping in her mites had any standing whatsoever? And yet Jesus full on stops, takes all his disciples and points her out and has all of their attention set on her and praises her for the sacrifice she made. You know, that's the kind of unexpected and delightful glory in heaven. All right, Gerhard continues. We'll just try to get to the end of this paragraph quick and then call it a day. And because of this supreme love, the joy of one will be the joy of all. Can you imagine that? Because in our base and fallen nature, the joy of one means, oh yeah, good luck, I mean, good for you. Why didn't I get that? (laughs) Now the joy of one is the joy of the other. We're all united back as one and as one creature. We're no longer individuals. We're all one corporate man, one corporate whole. And so rejoicing of one is rejoicing of all. There is no greater good in heaven or in earth than God. And so there can be no greater, no more perfect joy conceived uh, conceived of than to see God and to possess Him and to feast the eyes upon God, even for a single moment only, will far surpass all the joys of earth. For we shall see him as he is, and God shall be in us, and we in God. So again, he takes us back to the source and center of all these blessings, and the one chief blessing that makes all the others seem, as as great as they are, seem meaningless. Because to simply have God who is good, and to know his goodness in a way that we can't even conceive of it now, to receive his goodness... Mercy, yes. Righteousness, yes. Love, yes. Creativity, yes. Wisdom, beauty, everything that, you know, 
the saints in heaven ascribe to him in the hymnody of Revelation? Why are they ascribing those things to him? From us in our ironic, sarcastic, bitter, sinful state, it's like, it just seems like meaningless praise. Or it seems at worst even like flattery. What are these? But in heaven, when you're looking upon him, those words each take on such a profundity and three-dimensional depth that you're just, you're giving words to that which cannot be spoken. And every single one of those words just bursts through and bursts over, pours over with meaning as you try to describe what it is that you're seeing, who it is that is before you now and for all eternity. Well, we are out of time, so I'm going to leave it there. If you have a question or comment, please feel free to run up and grab me. Let's pick up next week at the bottom of 269. The Lord be with you. Amen.